Friends and family, welcome to another live broadcast brought to you by Premier's Turning Point with your host, Bishop Dr. Uton Lane and co-host, Overseer Franklin Williamson. We pray and hope that something that is being said today will bless your soul and spirit. Please take a quick moment to like and share this broadcast with your friends and family. Thank you again for joining us. Let's go into our live program. Blessings, blessings, blessings one and all. It's a pleasure to be back with you. Of course, I'm Bishop Dr. Yutong Lang, and we are listening to Premier's Turning Point. And we have an awesome uh, lineup for you today. Uh, we're going to be talking on the topic of uh, the ratio of men and women in churches. Uh, just uh, we thank God for you know, bringing us through the election season so we don't have to really focus on that as much. Hopefully in a few weeks we will know, you know, definitely everything lined up with the presidency. But it seems like we had a, a great turnout. So I really want to thank all those people uh, who went out and voted because we had to make a big issue of that. And I'm glad to say we had, there was an awesome turnout between mail-in and the regular voting. So that was very good. And so therefore, hopefully the people's choice will be uh, you know, well known and be in the presidency. So we don't have to talk too much about that over the next couple of weeks. So we are getting ready to turn our attention on, you know, just, you know, the church in general, the things that are going on. And especially today, we wanted to look at, you know, the, uh, um, the reasons or, or if we could find out the reasons why it seems that there's a more predominance of uh, women in churches, especially in the Christian church, uh, than, uh, than men. So we want everybody to make sure you chime in on this topic today. We'll be looking out for your comments as you, you know, you share. And uh, we want you to right now to just go on and share uh, with all your friends, you know, those on Facebook, on uh, YouTube, and ask them to join and to like. And then on uh, YouTube also to subscribe to our channel so that they can be notified when we're on. So we want you just to get ready. Uh, of course, uh, Bishop Dr. Lang, uh, Overseer Franklin Williamson may be a little bit late getting on, but we're going to proceed. We have two awesome uh, pastors on, and uh, right now I'm going to uh, step out of the way and have them uh, uh, introduce themselves. Of course, we'll start with ladies first and to induce yourself and just to share with the audience. So uh, Pastor Green, go ahead. Grace and peace. God bless you tonight. I'm grateful to be in such great company. I was pulled into this suddenly. And um, it is exciting to be on and to be able to share with everyone. And so I look forward to the discussion tonight. Greetings to Bishop Lang and to all the other panelists that are on tonight and we just look forward to an awesome time god bless you blessings blessings uh pastor green just say you know where you're pastoring and such a like just so we can have an idea oh okay so sorry i am from the no gospel of tabernacle church our branch is located at 725 franklin avenue in brooklyn I also work out of the main uh, headquarters, which is at 2314 Snyder Avenue, also in Brooklyn. Amen, amen. All right, so uh, Pastor Simpson, go ahead. Yes, thank you, uh, Bishop Dr. Lang. Uh, grace and peace to everyone. It's good to um, be asked to join this panel and with my uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, Pastor Williamson, Pastor Green, um, and Pastor Simpson. I am the senior pastor at the Faith Community Worship Center in Perth Amboy, that is uh, in Middlesex County in New Jersey. Um, I have been pastor now for 26 years um, and I have been uh, been saved now for about 46 years. That's uh, since 1974. Um, and this topic that we will be exploring is one that is of particular interest to me. I've always wanted to 
uh, delve deeper into it. And um, I, I really um, look forward to us having uh, exploring the topic and, and just uh, at the end, really, um, which is going to be an ongoing discussion, just to, to see how we can implement changes. There's no, no use discussing uh, without it a goal towards uh, implementing a, a change. So I look forward to this. So thanks again, uh, Bishop Dr. Lang. Blessings, blessings. And I see Overseer has joined us, so we let him chime in and uh, not necessarily have to introduce himself or say what's going on. I think he has a, even a function today, but let's uh, hear from him. Ah, bless you, bless you. Bless you, Pastor Simpson. Bless you, Pastor Cinti Green. Thank you both for joining the panel and to Dr. Ling. Yes, yes, we have this topic and I think it's really um, a very important topic. And this may just be one of many series uh, looking at uh, the role of men or the, or the absenteeism of men in our churches. And uh, we want to look at what are the root causes. We want to look at the impact that that, that creates in, in our ministries. And also maybe look at our style of leadership right to see if these are some of the uh the reason uh why we don't have a large number of men and, and one of the big impacts is you know healthy marriages right a lot of sisters are still single uh marriages right now are being looked at as something negative when the rate is 52 percent who's going to invest in 52 <laughs> percent you wouldn't do that in the stock market. You wouldn't do that in a, any kind of matriculated course. 52% that's failing. But we do ask folks to step out of faith in 52%. So uh, I'm looking forward to the fruitful discussion uh, from both our panelists here this evening. Thank you. All right. So uh, so we're really excited about the, the, the topic. And as uh, all the pastors are saying, this is something that has been uh, very um, um, interesting to consider as to the reasons why. So I think we're going to start off and uh, uh, just saying, you know, maybe just let, or we could just say what is going on in our present congregations and, uh, you know, if any reasons or any ideas we have, and then we'll kind of put it together. So a premier family life, just as everywhere else, we do have a predominance of, of women would stamp out to, you know, probably three to two, you know, when you look at the, the average. Uh, and I think one of the, the, the things that I think is one of the reasons, especially in the older population, you know, you know, probably over 60s, 70s, uh, definitely we see a lot of men die earlier. So we have uh, that part of it is skewed a little bit. But I think we, when we talk, we may have to look at a different age group. But on the older age group, I find that's one of the issue is, you know, we have a lot of more widows uh, you know, in that group. And therefore, there's a little bit uh, more predominance of women. As you go down the other age groups, uh, we see the same thing that is plaguing, uh, plaguing the, the whole, you know, nation, the whole world is we see uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, single mothers uh, raising children because of various reasons. And I think we see some of the same thing in the church. But I think it'd be really interesting to see what else we can come up with so that's uh we can go to overseer next and then on the line mm -hmm. all right yes yeah just to talk about my local assembly uh, mm -hmm. i think um the ratio is much higher i think maybe mm -hmm. one to five maybe mm -hmm. one to five and mm -hmm. um, when i look at the leadership roles you know look at my deacons my uh we have a men's ministry and pretty much the men, uh, our, our Christian education ministry is led by a woman, our marriage and single ministry by, led by women, our youth department led by women, uh, our pantry <laughs> women, uh, our prior ministry, I've got a brother leading that, uh, our choirs, well, for the men choir, the men, but it's, it seems where we divide the church on gender is where you find the leadership by gender. And uh, most of the other areas are led by women. Now, 
you could say, Pastor Wise, that when we look at the availability of the resource and talent and those who are there are the women. So we have a problem with, use the term in, in our regular vernacular, pipeline. Our pipeline is not filled with men, it's filled with women. So mm -hmm. we got a, a lot of work to do as pastors. So that's kind of what my church looked like. And uh, I'm not here to bash women. Uh, if if nope. your church have no women, please don't invite me. <laughs> I'm not going to come because if it had not been for those ladies who rose up early in the morning, went to the tomb to spice the Savior and tell the disciples, come, he is risen, then today we wouldn't have the gospel. So ladies play a very integral role. So ladies, those who are listening, I don't want you to tune out or change the channel, <laughs> I'd like you to stay engaged, okay? Because we're trying to see yeah. how we can ensure that there's men in the ministry that can be great husbands, great fathers. Thank you, Bishop. Yeah, that's that's a good point. No, you know, we're not, you know, putting our ladies down. I mean, uh, you know, if we, we did have them, you know, we would not have a lot of the things going. So we really wanted them to stay strong. And actually, I would like to hear from some of the ladies as to maybe some pointers, what do they think we can do? You know, what is, what's the cause, you know, so they may have some insight as well. So uh, we, as we go on further on, hopefully we'll hear uh, from some of them. All right, Pastor Simpson. All right, uh, yeah, so the, the ratio um, in our church is uh, pretty much representative of uh, the broader community. Um, and mm -hmm. the broader community is not just uh, up, as we would say, like precious faith, the Pentecostal churches. It is Christianity in general. You know, there um, has been over centuries now, actually, um, a, a an exodus of men from uh, uh, churches. And, um, you know, I... I like to to look at, at data and studies um, to give me an idea of what's going on and and, and what I've come up with. Um, uh, I think it's Leon Pottles who's written a book, The Church Impotent. Um, and in 1936, um, you know, he gave like a breakdown in a, a different religious affiliation. You know, Roman Catholics, Lutheran, Mennonites. Uh, Pentecostals and Christian scientists. And uh, in 1936, right, um, I'm not going to go through these numbers because there are many and, you know, I can provide a reference after, you know, but it, it was yeah. in Roman Catholics, probably one to one, one. Um, so it would be like 50% each. Um, Lutherans are around the same, Mennonites, uh, Pentecostals was between 1.7 to 2, which means that's about, you um, 66% of the church was comprised women and 33 uh, men. That was in 1936. But even in centuries be before, they, you know, they have been seen that men really have not been um, attracted to to churches. Now, it, it, it's interesting um, that in 19... In, in 19, sorry, 1952, um, that percentage, it would be like about 53% female, 47% male. And just to come down in 1990, that was 1952, 1992, 43% men were attending church. But by 1996, it's only 28% that was um, of the churches comprised um, uh, men. And, uh, you know, it is not unusual, especially in the black church to see that it's 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 a one in seven so to me that's like about 10 percent of our churches is really um men which is probably what i see generally i've been as i said saved now for 46 years and and that's what i've been seeing probably about 10 percent of the church um comprise uh yes. men what is interesting though is that um and it's changing but most of our churches the leadership are men but the pew mm -hmm. um, uh, doesn't reflect that. It reflects that uh, there's predominantly women 
Um, and, and, you know, we, we, we need to go, you know, there are several things that we could go into, you know, reasons just to explore, to discuss, to see why, 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 why that's the case and what we can do to change that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And we'll come around for the reasons. Uh, Pastor Green, yeah. uh, if you could just share with us, you know, what's the ratio in your, your assembly and what are your thoughts about why? Okay. Uh, I'll just speak about uh, 725 Franklin Avenue. Mm -hmm. However, uh, perhaps in the end, I could say something of our previous ministry under Bishop Green. Presently at uh, 725 Franklin Avenue, it says if the women outnumber the men 10 to 1. And uh, we try to create a lot of programs where the men would show interest and want to come out. But as of yet, nothing really catches as we would have it too. So what I did once was to invite a Seventh-day Adventist friend because I was very curious why their fellowship have so many men. I went to a concert and I fellowship with some of them, the Adventist men, and on Sabbath, they're pretty much there. The, the, the congregation is filled with the men. So I invited this friend of mine, Seventh-day Adventist, to come and have a talk with our men to find out what could we do to attract more men in our congregation. And... Uh, one of the things that he shared with us is that they have more leisure time. The men of their uh, faith share more leisure time together. They, they uh, gather for rap sessions. They go uh, bowling. They just do more things together as men. And so as a result, they attract a lot more, not just the senior men, but also the younger men. And uh, something else, the men uh, feel as if they need a sense of purpose. They don't just want to be coming and... Uh, sitting in worship or standing in worship they they they're they're wanting to be occupied in uh in meaningful ways and so a lot of our congregations are female dominant and because of that i think a lot of the men tend to shy away Amongst us, there's not a lot of men, but the men who are there, they are very active. And as a result, we can actually count on them coming and supporting whatever programs are in order. So uh, back in Bishop's days, I think they, they men admire this 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 masculine drive this masculine push so wherever he was the even if he didn't invite them to come and do anything they would just show up to be there just to be in his company and uh, as a result he had a, a, a very large following of, of men of all ages younger men there's a uh, Pastor Franklin, he's the, he's one of them. And uh, they used to flock him. If he was just barely there to do tiling, even the unsaved men would show up. So I think what it is, is that men are looking for strong masculine leadership. 
uh, purpose-driven leadership. Uh, they want to feel belonged and want to feel like they're not just there, but they have things to do. They're a part of. And so uh, back in Bishop Green's days, uh, there wasn't any want or lack of men. And I remember too, one of the things that attracted the men is that uh, he would challenge them like, you know, I need some men. I need men to drive the programs that I'm doing. And as a result, even if they were not uh, qualified educational wise or even gifted or talented, but they would be there in the mix because they knew that somewhere along the line, somebody was going to identify them and say, you are of use and uh, I'll start you off with small things or whatever it is that you're capable of doing and allow you to work yourself up into higher ranks, if you will. Okay, so uh, that's as much as I can say at this point. Perhaps further on, I'll be able to, to you know, put in some other points, but for now, yeah. Okay. Overseer, you could pick up on that since you know some of what she's talking about there, and maybe we can, you know, glean on some of that. Yes, I can. I can address that. Um, I think, and I was really talking about uh, the late Bishop Samuel Green, and, and uh, his ministry really had a high population of men. He was a planter of of, uh, mm -hmm. of churches, and his ministry was the feeder. Now, when I look today at most of the Pentecostal churches, I'm going to be honest with you, they came through his ministry and they are great bishops mm -hmm. today. And he took pride in that. One of the things he did, he mentored. He was a great mm -hmm. mentor to the young men. And I think we have lacked the mentorship programs. Uh, he also created a platform for you to strive. He wasn't intimidated. <laughs> he, he was comfortable in his skin. Uh, may not have had the highest education, but that didn't stop him. He had the vision and that's all we needed to know. He had the vision. So it's a matter of uh, the leader investing in the men and also assigning the men with tasks. Men <laughs> not going to just sit and enjoy a two hour of praise and dance. That's not no. what the man would like to do. So uh, look around your church, okay, building maintenance, you're gonna take care of the building. Uh, so not everybody's gonna be back behind the pulpit, right? There are other ministries where men can be gainfully employed. So yes, I think that it's a testament. And also, let me add this piece, he took care of the needs of men. <laughs> You won't be in that church as a man underemployed or unemployed. He would make sure that he would go to you at job interviews. He will get on the train, get on the yeah. bus. He yeah. will pay your fare. So he was involved mm -hmm. in the welfare of the man. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, when he sent me to the Bronx to pastor and he said, hey, did you get your marriage license yet? I said, Bishop, no. He said, okay, meet me here. That was at the Supreme Court in the Bronx. And he took care of all of that. I mean, he was so much in um, a servant of God, ensuring that the people of God, especially the men, were qualified and were prepared for ministry. And I think that's mm -hmm. what garnished and, and caused men to flock him. Mm -hmm. So so I think what, what we're hearing from that, and this, uh, you know, one thing we can clean on is that we need to make the men feel involved. Uh, we need yes. to, you know, you know, be supportive, more like a, a, a camaraderie group that they have to fall back on. Maybe events and and um, functions that geared around them, you know, to, mm -hmm. to give them a sense of purpose. 
uh, is probably one thing that I, that I'm hearing, you know, out of that. Yes. Uh, Pastor Simpson, any thoughts on that? Yes, I I, I certainly agree um, that if you have a purpose-driven ministry, as uh, Pastor Green mentioned, um, that it, it's very attractive for men. Men want to feel uh, everyone, but we're talking about men want to feel actualized. They want to have a sense of purpose, a sense of direction. Men love to be taught. They love to to be mentored um, in such a way. And 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 uh, and I I I I see see that. Um, uh, the, you know, churches that will do that will tend to attract more men. Or just certain things that we do generally in our churches, uh, mm -hmm. as our prior speakers have mentioned. You know, I I can recall um, that we've had events and uh, the events that is more laborious. You know, he heavy labor. Um, I will see men from the community come in that I was like, you know, who are these people? But they are attracted um, to to things like that, right? Um, so I, I certainly agree. Uh, but there are other things also, you know, because we just can't always have events or enough events to have men come out all the time. Why are uh, men are not men not coming to our churches or to worship? on a Sunday or every Sunday, right? Because most of the events we have, um, they're not typically on the, the day that we worship on a Sunday. Why are they not coming to church on a Sunday um, or during the week? And we, I think we should also explore the, the mode of worship. Um, uh, certainly our churches are predominantly women. Um, and by virtue of that, uh, the mode of worship tends to cater towards women. Um, uh, it's very emotive, very emotional. Um, if we were to sit back and listen to the songs that we sing, um, and, you know, songs that really cater to nurturing, to emotion, um, you know, to having to relationship um, and how typically the churches also just perceive um, Jesus, uh, you know, the bride, um, he is, the church is the bride of Christ, but even more than the church, each individual is considered the bride of Christ. And so uh, men are coming and they're, feeling that they you know the individual person is the bride of christ and what does that mean you know you are you know uh, safe in the arms of of god and even though you know we're talking about god but so consciously uh, men are seeing uh this this um this kind of kind of emotional expression towards god or jesus who it, we perceive as another man. So we have to explore what that is doing, the songs that we sing, right? Um, uh, the, the messages uh, that um, we deliver where, you know, I, I, I want to argue that men are more cognitive. They will, they like to think, they like to be taught, they like to sit down, less emotion and more, you know, let's, you know, more visual, men are more visual. So, you know, it, it's, it's just like when, uh, when Jesus in his teaching or, you know, his interaction while he was in his ministry, you know, he uses different visual things, you know, um, give me a coin and, you know, there was a message from that coin or, you know, um, he was walking in the field and he plucked um, the wheat, uh, the corn, and 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 they express that or walking on water so things that are visual and i have had ex experiences I, I, you know my delivery is 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 not always the same sometimes i get into a teaching where i use a projector or i i project um and i teach with visual sometimes i i come in with 
uh, you know, um, certain objects or bring an object in and, and I make it more very visual. And those times when I do that, I can tell you almost invariably that the men who are in church would become more involved and they would come back to tell me how well they received that. So men are more more vigilant. So we have to look at the um, the mode of worship, you know, even the songs that we want our men to sing. Um, I could even go to say even the decor of our churches, you know. Um, so th these are different things that we uh, I would like for us to explore too, you know. Um, in my search, I'm seeing that there, there's just multi factors why, uh, you know, I can get my men to special events, but I need to be able to get them out on a weekly basis to come out to worship. You know, and what is hindering that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. I think it's uh, very interesting when you think about it. And uh, mm -hmm. you're right, it's really a multifaceted reasoning. Some of them is just men are men. Uh, and, you know, their needs are a little bit different. And you're right. Uh, we have to really start thinking, are we reaching out to them, you know, and meeting, you know, you know, touching off their interests, you know, the way we're presenting, the way we're acting, the roles that, that we give them. And you're right, the, the, the church, uh, <clears throat> you know, is, you know, we have to rethink what I think what we're doing to see how can we best reach out. I think one of the, the, the place that I see is, and this is in general, and it may be a, a making a general statement, but I find that even the men, it's harder for men to commit, you know, to various things, you know, even in a marriage, you know, even, you know, that's why if a lot of the time men get married a lot older, you know, even if you do that study, there's some studies on that. And uh, the reason, a couple of reasons why that is, but commitment is a little bit more difficult uh, for men to make. So even committing to Christ and committing to a particular work. Is, is maybe one of the issues that we're dealing with as well. Now, I, I wanted, before we move on, I want to point out, I did look up uh, some stats as well, and actually it was interesting. And so now I'm going out of Christianity, but think about it. Uh, some other uh, religions are predominantly men. And so mm -hmm. I think we could glean some stuff uh, from them, because if you look at the studies, uh, you see uh, the, I look one of the Muslims, for example. Muslim. Um, they have uh, is like sixty five percent men to thirty five percent women. Also, the um, another group is the uh, the um, oh, the uh, Hindu, about sixty two percent men to thirty eight percent women, and uh, there was another big group, the um, the Orthodox, even Orthodox Christian was more even. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's a, so so there's various groups that I and mean, so my thought was you know what are you know some of the differences between those group and uh, Christianity and the Christian men that would make men flock to them more. Anybody have any thoughts? On that well, thank you, overseer. So go ahead, uh, Pastor Green. Yes, sir. As I said before, meeting with this uh, Seventh Day Adventist uh, gentleman, uh, mm -hmm. men love strong leadership, and uh, they love things being accomplished. They don't want to hear about half-finished projects and things that are uh taking a long time to to get done they they want movement they want to they they want to be in something that what i've heard over the years is they want to be in something that is moving something that is making a difference that for example in the community the uh, others can see that something is being accomplished. So if, if that is not being done, they, they lose interest very quickly, okay? They don't wanna hear that, oh, I'm gonna purchase this piece of property. They wanna be under somebody who's gonna make it happen. 
or even if it doesn't come through on time, they want to see whatever it is, it is needing to allow that thing to come to pass. They want to see actions moving forward in that area. I have three sons and uh, right now only one really goes to church. And the other two, their complaint is that they want to be in something that is moving, that is accomplishing, that is making a difference. And they don't see that in the church. So as a result, why join something or why belong to something that is not producing? They don't just want to go to a place, as, as Pastor Simpson says, where we sing songs that are, uh, I, I listened, if I can quote Bishop Holsworth from Jamaica. Bishop Holsworth said we sing a lot of songs like, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the song. He touched me. <laughs> he says, that is a female song. song he touched right. me. A, a man doesn't want to be singing uh, for half an hour. He touched me, <laughs> and things like that. They they want they want to to as Pastor Simpson shared before. They want to be a part. They want they want movement. They want responsibilities, and uh, I think a lot of it is due to the type of leadership that we have these days a lot uh, because there's a lot of women in church pastors tend to lean on the women a lot the women lead worship service the women give the announcements the women uh, uh they are the ones um caring for the children they're the youth leaders mostly. But back in Bishop's days, he grabbed the young men. Franklin was one of them. And I guess Franklin was youth leader for, uh, I can't even name the number of years. <laughs> and it's, it's like Frankie said earlier, and, uh, Excuse me, not saying Overseer Williamson, because he got started from so young. And Bishop said to him, as long as you are out there, you're going to be Brother Frankie. You could become the bishop, but because he was mentored in such a way to, to be an overall person, to push the men, to push women's ministry to push everything everybody and this is one thing that is lacking too and i know i might be just throwing a lot of stuff out there now um you have to be able to identify with people doesn't matter what category you could be from wall street you could be from uh the governor's office you have to the leader, the men have to be able to come down. And that was one thing about Bishop. He was able to, to just mingle with everyone. He was able to take off his Bishop robe. And if they were cleaning the gutters, jump in there with them and even show them how to do it. And then he was able to leave them and say, okay, get it done. And it was going to get done. So um men look for a lot of masculine drive a lot of masculine push which i feel is not there today um we need to work we used to have a program at the church and they used to do it uh at least once per year where they gather all the young men together and bishop used to do that too gather all the young men together and if it was in our living hall or in the church hall he would start to teach them how to present a message how to preach how to 
conduct themselves over the pulpit so that when they did get a chance, they didn't have to feel embarrassed or bashful or whatever because they had some props from earlier and time and time again that was repeated. The youngest of the youngest, they were brought into such sessions. And so that helped the men, that helped to attract them. It wasn't just the ladies, but he really um, deposited from they were as young as ever. Uh, I remember Elder Gale, and I'm sure that Pastor Simpson and, and you, Bishop Lang, knows Elder Gale. They started Elder Gale from a uh, children's church. And every Sunday, this group of children would go downstairs under the supervision of some uh, teachers, public school teacher, um, social workers, whatever their, their uh, civic duties were. But they would all go downstairs and they would have something that was similar to our own adult worship service. And those people would have them down there. Kevin was in that group. And young as he was, they started to call him the bishop of the children's church. And so, so much was, was, was being deposited in them from a young age that after they got to the age where they could be um, consecrated as ministers or or whatever leadership position, it was much easier because they, they, they were being groomed from earlier on. So I believe that that is lacking now, a lot of the grooming, a lot of the mentorship. And the other thing too, is when they made mistakes, it wasn't uh, uh, called out and and beat them over the head. It was like, you can do better. You can do it. You've got to do it. And with those type of uh, incentives, if you will, they wanted to be a part. They want, oh my God, they would miss youth service. They would miss any, nothing, because they just wanted to be there to, to receive, to be mentored, to be told of their potential, what they could do. And so I think these things are, are lacking a lot these days. And that's why we have such a huge drop in our Pentecostal circles. I wouldn't even say so much in our Christian circles, but in our Pentecostal circles, the, the drop is huge. But this is a good discussion tonight and we can glean from it and help those that are coming on. I have a whole slew of young men and I, I started up a, a little Zoom class just, just about a month ago and I'm trying to, to grab them from the side, if you know what I mean, and to, to bring them in and say, come on, get involved. Young ladies, young men, you know, get in here. You're not in the big open. You're not in front of 300 or, or 400 people, but this is a, a little space where you can feel comfortable. You can um, make your mistakes, you can be corrected, and you can, you can grow from there. So I think we need, especially now in COVID, a lot of these little cell groups that we can uh, try to rebuild confidence in leadership. All right. Okay. Anybody wanted to add to that? I think, I think Pastor uh, Overseer is muted. Overseer, you're muted. Okay, someone let him know he's muted there for me. All right, so so it's really interesting when you look though and see some of the things. I well, some of my research uh, was, uh, and I think goes along with some of the things that uh, uh, Pastor was saying is that 
one of the thought is that, you know, we have, uh, over the years, uh, one guy wrote a book is why men ain't going to church. And his main uh, <laughs> thought is that in the mother, there's, says so that is the modern feminization of the church that is driving mm -hmm. men away. That was one, one of the thought. And I think of, we have heard some alluding to that in how we worship, how we preach, how we, we teach. And this oh, young man, he cool. argues, he argues that the church has wrapped the gospel in this man repellent package. I mean, he's had some strong words by presenting the church as a relational and nurturing congregation. And he thinks that this warm presentation of the church is alienating to more and more the goal-driven competitive men. So this is one of the theme that I'm kind of hearing from uh, speaking to, you know, from on the ear. So I'm going to do a little bit more, even more research in, in that, and I think somebody, uh, a couple people online uh, were alluding to that we need more mentorship, uh, and even, especially for the young people, uh, to also let them know it's okay, you know, that they may run into problems, difficulties, but we need more mentorship just to kind of get everybody, you know, uh, you know, up to speed. So I think there is some substance to this feminization of the, of, of the churches you know, by virtue of the way we teach, the way we preach, the way we present. And that's something I think we can look further into. I know, Overseer, you were muted, so are you yeah. with us yet? Can you hear me now? Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Go ahead. All right, beautiful. Yeah, there, there are many factors. Um, to be quite frank, I'm thinking of doing my doctoral dissertation in, in this, this major problem. Um, I've looked at the statistics and I've you know, when you look at statistics, you got to be careful and understand, you know, what's your end sample, right? How many people are you pulling into your sample? Is it random? Uh, when we look at the Hindu and the Muslims, we also got to look at how, the, what role women play in the church, in their, in their church. And we know women are pretty much not playing a dominant role. The men plays a dominant role. So in our church, we allow, we see women as equal. You know, the Bible teaches we neither male nor female. So it's not so much a, a, the gender, but it's so much the responsibility and role. So that plays in our, our numbers. But listening to uh, all our panelists here, there are a couple of nuggets I want to leave that we need to do as pastors. One, we got to write a vision. Many churches are operating with, without a vision. And when you articulate that vision, men can run with that. Also, create a project-based church, okay? Create some milestones. As you said, what are we gonna accomplish? Not just sit there week after week, month after month, year after year. Uh, they want to roll up their sleeves and make things happen. What are we doing for the community as a church? The men love to serve, and are we creating opportunities for them to serve? You mentioned that Bishop had always tapped into the young men. Yes, we have to get out of our comfort zone as pastors and reach down and pull up our young men and let them know <laughs> that they are a rare species but their talent and their gift will make room for them. And I will add this piece. There are a couple of things that the church does that don't attract men. For example, <laughs> and I may get a lot of slack for this, on Super Bowl night, are you going to tell me you're going to have a night service? No, if you do, you should really make some adjustment to have it maybe in the lower fellowship hall and maybe it's definitely the flat screen and they're having some chicken wings, they're having popcorn, ice cream, and you're pulling the men together. We have to do church differently. We talk about the aesthetics, even the color of the paint that we put on the walls, lilac, pink. I mean, uh, you know, we got to find some neutral colors, the drapery. There are so many things that attract the woman, and, and that's 
where we as leaders, as, as pastors, get a step back and look at how we are administrating the church. I think, to be quite frankly, we have a great part to play. There's a second part of the discussion is, if the pastor is a female, do we see more men in church? Or if the pastor is a male, do we see more women? Let me say this to, to pastors, and I'm talking to myself. We find it much easier, just the way we are made up, to witness more to women than to men. The song we mentioned, He Touched Me, again, if we teach our men that when we speak of Jesus, we're not speaking of the physical, but it's a spiritual touch. And men need to sing that song and don't feel that <laughs> they're being violated. So we have a lot to do as leaders. Step back and see if we're also pulling the men closer in our circle. Jesus Christ chose 12 disciples. Yes, they were the Mary, they were Martha's, and they were very close. Without them, his ministry could not be viable. His ministry could not last. But the leadership role from the foundation of the world, he created Adam first, then took from his side a rib. So they will be parallel alongside us. So pastors, we have a lot of work to do. And I'm looking at my local ministry and, and, and thank God for the COVID. It allows us to rest, allows us to reflect. It allows us now to look at the ministry differently and see where we can create opportunities for our men to lead. And uh, we don't have to have all the keys. Let's delegate some of these keys to some of these men. And we'd be surprised to see how our ministry grow. Because my biggest concern is sisters who are coming up in the ministry, 12, 13, 14, by the time they're 25, leaving college, they're looking for a good Christian husband. There is none in the church. So you know what they do? Let me date someone in college who is not saved with the hope that he will become a Christian. And most of the times, uh, that is a lost cause. So I want to impress the burden on our pastors that we now really have to step back. There is no reason. There's no reason. Uh, I, I, I talk about one pastor, Pastor A.R. Bernard. He has a bike ministry. He does golf. My pastor over there, Pastor Nunes, he has a cricket club. You know, so there are things that we have to do to really let the men be a part of our ministry and thinking outside of the box. And many of us as pastors are not comfortable there. So uh, that's it. That, that's my <laughs> input on that. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really all great because I think uh, there's no one way to solve this or look at it. And I think it's time we're putting everything but I definitely think there is some credence to, you know, especially in the Pentecostal, the evangelical churches over the years. I yes. think we have become, you know, and not that we're, and don't get me wrong, we've become so religious, you know, and more focused on that, that we don't look at the full big picture and see how are we going to reach out to the men, uh, you know, as well as the women. For example, one other writer I was reading, he says, when his question was, and I thought it was a good one, and he says, when was the last time you heard a sermon discussing the topic of work? And even right. though, even though, you know, you have a lot more women in the workforce, there's still 60% of the men are the breadwinners, you know, when you look at it. And so, you know, when last have we even, you know, you know, ventured into some of those topics as a way of, you know, you know, giving these men a feeling to be a part. So, we really have to go back to the drawing board, I said. So whether it's whether well, the program, of course, the gospel message stays the same. You know, you got to be saved. you got to be washed in the blood. But, you know, how we go around then to pull it all together is really, you know, what I think we, we got to be looking at. And I'm sure we're going to have to continue this topic. Uh, so I want, uh, you know, um, we're probably going to have most of our panelists to come back. But we're going to also do a little bit more research and see ways and things. 
I still think, I still think uh, that, you know, there is also an issue of commitment with men. I really, there's a one of my thing, and from all the teaching, especially counseling, marriage counseling that I've done and all this stuff, I still, I always run into that little issue. And I think that's just part of your, the DNA of how men are made. And so we have to see how we're going to speak to even that part. You know, I think it's going to be all, all creative we get with getting men to see Christ for who he is, is also going to go a long way in helping us to, you know, reach out you know, to a lot more. So we're going to go around the room and for kind of last words for today. So we're going to start with Pastor Simpson, then we're going to go to Pastor Green, then uh, we'll go to Overseer, and then come back to me. Yes. Um, so thanks again. Uh, you know, I think most people know the saying that says that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and, ex uh, and expecting a different result. Um, and, you know, our churches, there is uh, a real problem, a real concern, a real issue. Um, and if we want to see change, we have to step back, evaluate, assess, and do something uh, differently. Um, and, uh, you know, I have been thinking about this and uh, even so much now that we've been having this discourse that I need to kind of reevaluate um, my church's um, mission statement. Should I, uh, should we come up with a mission statement as uh, a vision a statement that is going to be focused on um, bringing more men into our churches because um, you know, the imbalance is real. The effect of the imbalance is real, as has been mentioned. You know, many of our sisters don't know what it is to experience um, a certain type of level of relationship because the men are just not there. Um, we don't have the mentors for our young men in the church. They don't see uh, good role models, not enough of them. Um, and just so much more, you know, the community is impacted negatively by this, not just our churches, the, the, the homes are impacted. So it's a real concern. And I think um, uh, it is not uh, uh, male versus female. Uh, it it impact all of us uh, equally. And we just need to step back, reevaluate, reassess, um, you know, look at our vision statement and, and make the necessary adjustments. Thanks again. Blessings. Pastor Green. Bless you, bless you. Uh, I think she may be frozen. Go to the overseer. I think Pastor Green may be frozen at the moment. All right. Yes. Um, final words. We have a pandemic on our hands where we are not going and making deliberate deliberate forces to garnish men in the ministry. And I'm calling pastors to take up the challenge. Our mission for 2020, when we sang Happy New Year, was we need 50 men, 50 women, and 25 children. So far, we have baptized 10. Uh, have we baptized any men? None yet. We have one young lad. And as Bishop mentioned, commitment. But I need to find out what did Jesus do? And uh, if I got to go into more studies, because the requirement for walking with the Lord is not one that should be taken lightly. And I believe men understand the weight of committing to Christ. And maybe because they take it seriously, they shug the role. But I'd like to speak directly to men, to let them know that, you know, especially the movement called Black Lives Matters. If the life really matters, we want men to pick up, pick up their role and come to know Jesus, build your family, leave a legacy, and create a family 
where there's one male, one female, and godly children. We will come back to this because we have just scratched the surface. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Thank you. Yes. So we thank everybody for uh, listening and joining us today. We'll definitely be reaching out to our panelists and maybe involve one or two more. So we want to really go into this topic over the next few weeks. And so, uh, you know, all those listening, we invite all your friends. Also, we're sending your questions, your concerns, your ideas, and we hope to be able to come out of this, you know, much stronger. I think one of the things that really excites me is, you know, we're, you know, trying to do something. That's really, you know, we're trying to look at this, you know, not just say, okay, that's how it is and throw our hands yeah. up, but yes. we're looking now. You know, how can we tackle this? Because listen, the Lord God is, is awesome. So we can, we can look to him for direction. And then we got to listen and then put it all together. So God bless you. Hopefully everybody have a wonderful week. All right. And keep praying for our country, uh, that yes. everything will go smoothly, uh, over the next few months and that everything will just be in order because God is able. God bless you. God bless God you. Bless God bless you. you. Love you all. Point family. What an awesome time we just had. To all our first-time guests, we truly appreciate you for joining our live broadcast. We would like to hear from you, so please send us your comments, questions, or testimonies of how this program has impacted your life. Our email address is info at pflmi.org. Finally, if you feel led at any time to give to this ministry, please visit us at pflmi.org and click on the tab for donations. You can also give via cash app at dollar sign pflmiorg. We're looking forward to meeting with you live on next week's program. Have a blessed and prosperous weekend.